Let us leave aside then our consideration of the Apology and the Crito, and now let us turn our attention to Plato's The Republic. The Republic is probably most famous uh, in most people's minds because in Book 7 of The Republic, he lays out a very famous story known as the Parable of the Cave, in which he imagines a bunch of people chained together looking at a wall and behind them is a fire. He uses this as a kind of a metaphor for how we understand the truth and the light. But we're not going to actually read that part of the Republic because we all know it already. We're going to read large parts of the Republic that most people don't ever read. And for some of you, you're going to find this to be a super crazy, bizarre book. Others of you, however, might well find it uh, extremely interesting. So whatever the case, what we're going to do is we're going to go through the Republic and ask what is Plato trying to tell us in this work and what is going on. Once we get through it, we will not yet be finished with it because we're going to then turn our attention to Aristotle's The Politics. And once Aristotle has laid out sort of a, a set of opening terms and conditions in The Politics, the very next thing he does is he attacks the Republic. He attacks uh, Plato's vision of political society as it is laid out in the Republic, which is not surprising because does anybody know who Aristotle's teacher was? Plato. And it's an old tradition that students make their name by attacking their teachers. So there you go. So it's just as old as, old as life itself. So what we want to do is we want to look at what the Republic is about. And we're going to look at the Republic and try and ask what is going on in this book. What is Plato trying to, uh, trying, trying to do here? What confuses the reader of the Republic when they first open the book is they naturally assume that the subject matter of the Republic is, as the title promises, about republics. That the purpose of the book is to tell us something about how we should order political society, right, in the context of the Republic. Let's remember what the Republic means, res publica, the public thing, the idea of how we organize ourselves into some kind of political society. So that the, it's not unreasonable to think then that the Platonic text is a work fundamentally, primarily, in its principal focus of politics. It is therefore surprising to many people when they first read the Republic that it actually is not about that, that the purpose the, of the Republic is not to discuss the optimal organization of political society, but indeed something entirely different. Namely, how do we define justice, right? What is the meaning of justice? That is actually the occupation of the Republic. And as it turns out, the Republic, the idea of a large political society, people coming together, making rules for themselves, how they should live and the like, is simply an expedient measure, uh, if you will, almost a metaphor for then thinking through this problem of how do we define what is just? How do we define this question of, um, of justice? And so what we're going to do today is we're going to go through the first book and the first part of the second book to see how this question of justice is laid out by Plato. Uh, and then when we come back next week, we'll see how we'll look at the blueprint that Plato sketches of this sort of ideal republic that he creates in order to try to answer the, answer the questions. But it is for this reason. It is because Plato is interested in constructing the Republic as a kind of thought experiment to answer the question, what do we mean by the question of justice, that the Republic looks in so many of its particulars to be largely irrelevant or at least utopian in the descriptions that it presents and some of the uh, frameworks that it offers, some of the arguments that it puts forward about how political society should be arranged. When Aristotle will later come to criticizing the Republic and say parts of it are just frankly ridiculous, he's absolutely right. But the point about it is that the Republic is being constructed in this dialogue in a way to serve this larger question, how do we define what justice means. So as you're reading it for yourselves and you're going through it and you find these weird things like, for example, children stripped from their parents, the communal holding of property, and other kinds of weird propositions, remember then that the entire, ex ex uh, the entire endeavor is taking place in the context of working through this question. So let's start by looking at books one and the first part of book two in which uh, Aristotle lays out this idea of what is uh, of, of what is just. And he starts with this very famous phrase, I went down to the Piraeus yesterday with Glaucon. The story is told, actually, uh, there's a very famous German philosopher named Martin Heidegger uh, who taught 
philosophy for many years, I believe, at Heidelberg. And there's a very famous story told that he gave an entire class just on this book, so a full 13-week semester seminar on Plato's Republic. And the story goes that Martin Heidegger read that first statement. I went down to the Piraeus yesterday with Glaucon, and he never got any further in the text. He was able to fill up 13 weeks of semester's uh, lectures just on that one sentence. I don't know what he was talking about, but that's the story anyway. Luckily for you, I'm not going to do that because I... <laughs> do you know what the Piraeus is? The Piraeus is the port, right? The Piraeus is the port of Athens. So the city of Athens is up on a height, you know, the Acropolis at the top of the hill. And at the bottom, as it goes down to the sea, there is a port. So there is a kind of built-in metaphor, if you will, right at the very beginning of the book because it starts with Socrates leaving the city, right? Descending from the city down to the port. So if you, if you think of the city as a locus of justice, as a place where justice happens because a city is where laws happen and the like, we have this sort of opening idea of Socrates leaving the city, going to the port, and then there's a journey back, right? The journey is back up to the city. And so when Socrates leaves, he doesn't know what justice means. But by the end of it, at the end of his journey, the idea is that he has come, become aware of what it means to be just. So there's this sort of built-in, if you will, kind of uh, sketch around the whole journey of the Republic, leaving the city in one state, coming back to the city in the other. At any event, the story starts with this notion that, that uh, Socrates and, and this friend go down to the port to offer a prayer to a goddess. And on the way back, they stop in at the house of a very old man. He says, we were already on our way home and we were spotted by Polymarchus, the son of Cephalus. And so Polymarchus says, why don't you come to my dad's house uh, and we'll chat a little bit in the garden. And so the subsequent discussion all takes place in the garden of the house of this man, Cephalus. Does anybody know what the word Cephalus means, by the way? It refers to the head, right? It's the brain or the head. So they go to uh, Cephalus' house, and Cephalus is an old man. And so the dialogue starts because Socrates, making conversation with the old man, asks him, what is old age like, right? How does it feel, basically, to be old? Maybe something, for example, you might ask your parents or your grandparents, what's it like when you get old? You know, what's this what's strange experience? So they talk about it, and so Cephalus explains, when you get older, some strange thing, things happen to you, right? Your perspective shifts. He says, when people get old, they miss the things they used to enjoy when they were young. They recall their sexual exploits, their drinking, their feasting, and everything connected with those pleasures, right? The idea is seize your youth, so go do all of these kinds of things, because when you're old, you won't gain any enjoyment from them. Some of them complain about the lack of respect shown by their families towards old age, probably still true. I think they're putting the blame, however, in the wrong place, Socrates. If old age were to blame, then not only would I have felt the same about old age, but so would everyone else who has reached this age. And so he says, I have a different point of view. I don't feel like I miss all the drinking and the feasting and all the rest of it. He says, he quotes Sophocles, the poet. He says, Soph once when Sophocles was old, someone asked him, how is your sex life, Sophocles? Are you still capable of making love to a woman? <clears throat> Don't talk about it, my good sir, was Sophocles' reply. It is with the greatest relief that I have escaped it, like escaping from a fierce and frenzied master. Sophocles underlines that one of the pleasures of old age is you are no longer governed by your physical appetites, that those things that control you, as he calls it, like a fierce and frenzied master, so that you can actually uh, find space for yourself in old age that you don't have when you are young. As Cephalus says, continues, when our appetites fade and loosen their grip on us, then what happens is exactly what Sophocles is talking about. It is like a final release from a bunch of insane masters. So those things that guide our behavior when you're, when you're young release you and you have the capacity to be then free from your appetites. He says, both in this and in your relations with your family, there's only one thing responsible, and that is not old age, but your character. And as you get older, you recognize that your character matters. For those who are civilized and contented, then even old, old age is only a slight burden. And so as a result of all of this kind of reflection on old age, Cephalus comes to the conclusion that as you get old, what most makes you afraid is that you may die in a position of what he calls uh, injustice, that you may die in a way in which you have not paid the obligations that you owe. He says, Socrates, when you are confronted by the thought of your own death, you are visited by fear and anxiety about things which never troubled you before. 
The stories about what happens in Hades, that anyone who is unjust there will have to pay for it. Stories you once laughed at begin to trouble your mind. Suddenly you are full of suspicion and fear. You start calculating and considering whether you've done anyone any sort of injustice. And if you find many acts of injustice in your own life, you keep waking up in a panic in the middle of the night. The person with nothing on his conscience has fine and pleasant hopes, but those who do not are tortured and troubled. And so he says, at the end of your life, the thing that matters most is how much money you have. So you can pay what you owe, as he says. That's why I attach the greatest importance to the possession of money, so that you can pay what you owe, right? And so for Cephalus, the idea of justice is really very straightforward. Paying what you owe. That is the idea of justice. Uh, so if you have borrowed things that you return them, right? You pay back all the things that you've done. So Socrates listens to this sense of justice. Does, by, let me ask you, does that sound like a good definition of justice? Pay what you owe. It's pretty basic. Sir. Pretty basic. Yes. Or let's put it another way, that would mean the person who paid off his mortgage was by definition a just person. Does that sound right to us, simply paying what you owe? It reduces life to a kind of, a kind of experiential accounting system. Would you like the justice in your life to be essentially calculated, defined, classified in the same way that you might the balance sheet of a corporation. So, so this is obviously not a very satisfactory mm -hmm. idea of justice. And Socrates gives a very a simple and elegant refutation of this idea of that justice is paying what you owe. He says, but Cephalus, imagine if you had borrowed a weapon from somebody when they were of sound mind. And now later on, you want to go back and repay what you owe, which means giving the weapon back. But in the interim, the person has lost their mind. They've become crazy. They are foolish. You cannot trust them. Nonetheless, you borrowed a weapon from them. You owe them that weapon. Is it just then to give the person of unsound mind an instrument of destruction? Would you call that justice? And they say, well, good point, right? Good point. I'm not so sure. And so Cephalus says, well, I don't know. All I know is that when you get old, this is something that worries about you. Uh, the young men start to discuss this topic, and Cephalus says, I'm going to leave the discussion to you, young gentlemen. I've got other things to do. He doesn't want to waste his time with this stuff, so he leaves. So Cephalus's entire role, if you think about it, since Cephalus is the head, right, the role of the brain, this moment, is the only thing that he's there to do is to sort of provoke this discussion. Once the discussion is provoked, Cephalus's role is over, and he retires. The remaining part of the first book is then taken over and even the first part of the second book, to alternative definitions of justice, which are by degrees increasingly credible and convincing. And there are broadly, they are broadly represented by two characters who then uh, remain throughout the, the dialogue. One is Thrasymachus, who's in the garden, and Thrasymachus goes through uh, all of book one. And then the second one is Adiamantus and uh, Gla Glaucon, who late raise a second argument. So what we're going to do now is we'll consider the arguments of justice that Thrasymachus and that Glaucon uh, set forward, and we'll arrive ultimately at the reason why then we go then forward into the, into the Republic. So when Socrates has dispensed with Cephalus's rather simplistic idea that justice is paying what you owe, Thrasymachus speaks up, and he says, you basically, Socrates, you sound good, you like to use words, you're very much in favor of listening to your own voice, but ultimately, you're not really being honest. Let's be clear. What is justice? Justice is what is good for the powerful. Justice is what the strong define it to be. We live in the real world, not some sort of fantasy world, and ultimately, the powerful define the world as it is, and justice is simply another artifact of, uh, of the world. He says... You can't avoid the conclusion, my simple-minded Socrates, that those who are just come off worse than those who are unjust in every situation. Uh, and he says the easiest place of all to see this is if you look at the most complete form of injustice, the one which brings the greatest happiness to the person who practices it and the greatest misery to those who experience it, those who would not be prepared to practice it themselves. By this I mean tyranny, taking other people's possessions. If you are strong and you are able to take the things that belong to others, you make yourself happy, and you make the others around you miserable, right? Is it just to take other people's possessions? It is not a particularly just thing to do. On the other hand, if you take a bunch of things from other people, and now you have a nice, happy, wealthy, rich life, 
or nice, happy, uh, nice, wealthy, rich life. Are you not happy? Indeed, you are. Whereas the person who has been stolen from, are they happy because they are just as opposed to unjust? No, they're not. And so from Thrasymachus's point of view, justice and happiness, or unjustice and misery, are inverted. The just man is the unhappy person. The unjust man is the rewarded person, is the happy person. So a happy life is an unjust life. Those who seize and enslave the citizens themselves and not just their property are not called by these terms of reproach, meaning unjust. They are called blessed and happy both by their fellow citizens and by everyone else who hears about the wholesale injustice that they have practiced. Thrasymachus wants to challenge this first Socratic rebuke that Socrates delivers to Cephalus by saying, we need to live in the real world. We need to recognize what goes on. The strong survive, the strong succeed, the weak suffer. The strong survive precisely because they are willing to do things that conflict with our notion of what is just. And yet, by virtue of their strength, they lead happy lives. They are blessed. People look up to them. So therefore, is it not true that this notion of justice and happiness is in fact incorrect? That the just, that the just life and the happy life cannot go together. And Socrates then tries to refute Thrasymachus's argument. In so doing, he, lays, he, he puts out a line which is defined at 344e. He says, Thrasymachus, this matters. This question that we're discussing, it matters. We are trying to define what he calls the whole conduct of life, how each of us can live his life in the most profitable way, which essentially explains, if you will, the underlying fundamental preoccupation of this text. How should we live our lives? Should we live our lives according to a sense of justice, or is in fact justice a kind of artifact that gets in the way? How much should we be prepared to be moral expedients in our, in our conduct? That is a personal question, but as we'll see, it then becomes a political question, right? Because the kinds of politics that we practice presumably reflects the kinds of justice that we inculcate. But nonetheless, the point is that in the context of this very first book, through his argument, and quite a vigorous argument, with Thrasymachus, Socrates lays out the crux of the text. We are trying to define the whole conduct of life, how each of us can live his life in the most profitable, in the most profitable way. Essentially, then, Socrates lays out an argument against Thrasymachus's point of view, tries to uh, refute this notion that those who are unjust are, live happy lives are good, and those who are just live unhappy lives and therefore are bad. Tries to, if you will, restore what we might think is the natural order of these. The way he does that is by essentially trying to realign certain kinds of hierarchy. So for instance, he says, to give an example as, uh, with respect to how he refutes Thrasymachus's argument, he says, if you are a doctor and you are in charge of healing the sick, are the sick not below you? And, and Thrasymachus concedes that indeed, the sick are indeed below you, for they cannot heal themselves. Only the doctor can heal those who are sick. At the same time, by virtue of being a doctor, what is the skill that you have, right? You, are, you have the skill to heal. So in order for you to exercise your excellence, your virtue as a doctor, what must you do? You must practice not for yourself, on yourself. You must instead practice on who? On those who are below you, right? In other words, the doctor can exercise his excellence, his virtue, by extending his skills to those who are beneath him. In this sense, then, the doctors, uh, what the Greek called ariti, meaning their excellence or their virtue, the virtue of the doctor is essentially in extending his skills and extending what he can do to those who are beneath him. And he extends that then all the way up to those who rule. The excellence of those who rule is found not in how they rule for themselves for gain, but in how they rule for those who are being ruled. And so the excellence of rule comes from uh, this relationship between those above and those below. And so therefore, the ruler who rules for himself, according to Socrates, is in fact not good because they are not capable of exercising or realizing this capacity of excellence. He even goes so far to say, and I think it's a conceit that we would still like to think of today with respect to our political system, he says the best rulers are those who rule reluctantly, who do not want to be ruled, and who only accept uh, a position of authority because were someone else to do it, they would do it worse. And so therefore they take up this position reluctantly, but nonetheless in recognition that the society needs, as it were, uh, the skills that they bring uh, to rule. In this we come to a kind of key 
uh, Greek concept worth putting down on the board, which is this notion of ariti, which is sometimes translated as virtue or sometimes translated as excellence. In fact, we'll even see a, a, a variant of it later when we come to Machiavelli, because in the Machiavellian text, this question of virtu uh, in Italian, virtu is a very important idea. But the idea of ariti is that if you can do something, the degree to which you can do it is important for what is being done. So for example, as he, give, he gives the example of a liar player, but we might give the example of someone, say, who plays piano. You can play piano, and you can play it extremely well. The more, the better you can play it, right? The better you are, if you will, at demonstrating how what piano playing looks like. In other words, there's this striving towards the excellence in what you do. And Ariti, the sort of realization of the virtue of who you are, comes then through the expression of that excellence. He who is the most excellent doctor is the person who kills the least patients, not because the doctor cares, but because it reflects the excellence of their healing skills. Right? That's the sort of sense that we see in this idea of Ariti. If you can do the best, if you are able to do that which you are best at, that is what will then provide you with this source of happiness. That's what makes you a happy person. The doctor who kills many patients is unlikely to be a happy doctor, just like the captain who sails his ship onto the shoals of many shores and, and drowns a lot of his sailors is unlike to be a very happy captain. So in other words, the notion of, of being good, of being happy, links positively then to this sense of Ariti. What well, we might say, I mean, Thersimachus then responds and says, well, surely then those who can cultivate the greatest injustice and amass the most for themselves is who we should be extolling. This is the, the, the challenge that, uh, that Thersimachus lays out. But what Socrates wants us to say is that those who lead a just life are not unhappy, are not bad people by virtue of their being just, right? That's the kind of key element that he wants to sort of rescue from, from, this, from this argument. And ultimately, what it comes out in this discussion with Thrasymachus, what comes out of it, right, is this question of what is justice and why are we just? And if the purpose is, that, if, or if the conclusion is that the life you lead will not be a happy life nor a good one unless you are just, then it creates a powerful motivation for us to cultivate the justice that is within ourselves. If you will, it creates an imperative or a mandate for us to self-actualize as just people. Whereas if Thersimachus is right, we should all go around being thieving, stealing bastards and be only interested in how much stuff we can get from other people because that leads then to the ultimate sort of uh, demonstration of happiness. This is then what is at stake at the end of book one. It's this question of what is, what is the consequence of the just life and in what does justice consist? A better argument perhaps put forward uh, then that offered by Thrasymachus then comes at the beginning of book two, in which Thrasymachus sort of gets sulky and doesn't want to talk anymore because he feels that he's been vested in arguments. Actually, I don't know sure that Thrasymachus ever agrees with Socrates. It's more like he feels he's been talked into exhaustion by Socrates, which was one of the Socratic methods. Uh, just talk a lot, and eventually people will give up. Um, so, the, so these other friends of, uh, who are there, Talk, uh, pick up the argument, Glaucon and Adiamantus, and they sort of carry the question forward, saying, not so fast, Socrates, you've not yet convinced us that somehow it is a condition of Herman, human virtue for us to self-actualize as just people simply so we can be good and happy. Let's consider the question from a slightly different angle. And at this point in book two, uh, the whole question starts to become, I think, slightly more serious and slightly more uh, engaging. Uh, Glaucon starts by asking him, he says, consider what he calls three classes of goods or three classes of things. There is a good of the kind we choose to have because we value it for its own sake and not from any desire for its result. Enjoyment and pleasures which are harmless and produce no consequences for the future beyond enjoyment for the person who possesses them. So in other words, there are things that we do because they are good right in the now having a nice meal, having sex, stuff like that, things that feel good right in the moment, right? So things that we enjoy for the now. The second class of goods are things that we enjoy both for itself, both for, the, for, the, for what they produce immediately, and for their consequences. So for example, things like intelligence and sight and good health. It is good to be in good health both now and for the future. So in other words, it's something that feels good now and also will bring benefits later on. So those are the first two classes of good. One we might call immediate gratification, and the second we might call gratification with additional benefits. 
But there is a third class of goods, and you probably can guess what it is, which are things like, <clears throat> he says, <laughs> you could probably appreciate this, a class of goods which contains things like physical exercise, undergoing medical treatments when we are ill, practicing medicine, and earning a living, or as we would say, getting a job. These are things which are not pleasant now, but which will bring benefit in the future. So when you go out for that early morning 6 a.m. jog and it's cold outside and your legs just don't want to move, you don't feel great, but why do you do it anyway? Because you know it is a good thing to do. So in other words, we are willing to endure certain things which are not particularly pleasant for us in the immediate sense, but we do them because nonetheless we know that there is a deferred payout, there is a deferred benefit to pursuing them now. So in other words, we do them for the future. So he says these are the sort of universal categories in which we can classify goods. And by goods, he means sort of in the most generic sense, where intelligence is a good as much as a fine meal. So he says, what is justice? Into which of those categories would you put justice as a good? Into the first one, as an immediate gratification. Into the second one, something that feels both good now and will feel good later, or into the third one, unpleasant now, but good for the future. Well, which of those three categories is the best category, do you think? The second one, right? Because it both feels good now and it's good later. In fact, if you think about it, what's the best way to develop a good, a good long-term habit of physical exercise? Those of you in the room who are runners, you'll know this, right? If you can find running is a horrible activity, right? So it's like horrible gerbil activity. You sit around, it's totally pointless, right? You're thinking there, like, I'm only doing this so I can eat another donut and so on. What's the best way to actually make running something that's enjoyable is to actually get that, what they call that runner's high, right? So that at the end of your run, you get that sort of feeling that you can't really get in any other way, that moment of, I don't know, that sort of, that eclat, as they call it in French which arrive. If you can feel that, then running ceases to be an unpleasant activity that's good for you in the future, but also becomes a pleasant activity in the now, and you're much more likely to do it, right? So exactly right. The second category is certainly the best category. Feels good now, feels good in the future. And so Glaucon asked Socrates, he said, which of these three categories, into which of these three categories would you classify justice? And Socrates replies, in my opinion, it is in the best class, the class which is to be valued by anyone who wants to be happy both for itself and for its consequences. In other words, good now, good later, right? That's where we want, that's what justice is. It's something that's good now and good later. And Glaucon immediately responds, well, that's not what most people think. Most people are going to disagree with you. Justice doesn't feel good now. Justice only feels good later. It's something you do for the payoff, not because it's particularly rewarding now. If you think about it, it feels good now, it feels good later. It doesn't necessarily mean necessarily physical uh, gratification. It could also be, for example, that you are at peace with yourself, right? That you, that you feel comfortable with the decisions that you've made, that kind, of, that kind of thing, right? That you don't have regrets. Maybe these are the kinds of things that he might put into this category. But Glaucon disagrees. Glaucon says most people would put justice into the unpleasant class. We should cultivate justice in return for payment and reputation on account of public opinion. But purely for itself, justice is to be avoided like the plague. And so essentially Glaucon's argument is we are only just because other people are watching us. And therefore, we feel in order for us to sort of gain the reputation that we would like to have, we have to convince other people that we are just. Uh, he says, I'm going to revive Thrasymachus's argument. First, I shall say what kind of thing people reckon justice is and how they think it arises. Second, I shall claim that all those who practice it do so as something unavoidable against their will. In other words, the human will in Glaucon's um, advocacy of the Thrasymachus skepticism is that justice is not something that we want to pursue, but something that we are coerced into, into doing. Thirdly, I shall say that this view of justice as something that is unpleasant and coerced is rational, or a rational way for them to behave, since the unjust man in their view, meaning in their experience, has a much better life than the just man. Right? The person who can steal and take other people's goods and so on and so forth has more money, etc. So they seem to have a better life. And so he gives examples of what, uh, of what he means in all of this. He says, 
this is the first thing I was going to talk about. What sort of thing justice is and how it arises. Doing wrong, men say, is by its nature a good, and being wronged an evil. But the evil of being wronged outweighs the good of doing wrong. So in other words, the evil that you perpetrate on somebody else is greater than the benefit you might attain from it. Therefore, you avoid doing. It's not that you may not want to do wrong to other people. It's simply you're deterred from it, from the idea that you don't necessarily want to hurt the other person. It's not that your sense of justice prevents you from doing it. It's that you create a kind of reckoning, a kind of calculus. He says, as a result, when people wrong one another and are wronged by one another and get a taste of both, those who are unable to be wronged and achieve the other think it will pay them to come to an agreement with one another not to do wrong and not to be wrong. In other words, laws that we might create to prevent people from doing harm to each other are not because we are just people. It's an expediency. It's because we'd rather not be wronged against, and so therefore we're willing to give up the license to do harm to other people. Is that clear? In other words, harm perpetrated against me is sufficiently bad that therefore I'm not willing to tolerate it so that I can do harm to other people. Again, it's again this kind of idea of a covenant, of a contract. And he gives then a very famous story to prove what he means in the se uh, to argue, to establish this principle that justice is conventional. Because if Glaucon is right, that justice is something that, we, that is unpleasant, that we don't want to do, that we only do in order to accumulate some sense of reputation, it means then that our sense of justice is defined by those conventions of reputation. And in order to further demonstrate this, he gives a very famous story, one that some may be familiar to some of you, the so-called Ring of Gyges. He talks about, or he tells the story of the ancestor of Gyges the Lydian. They say he was a shepherd, a serf of the man at the time who ruled Lydia, Lydia being a kingdom in what is today uh, southwestern Turkey. He said there was a great rainstorm and an earthquake opened up and the hole appeared. He looked into the hole and he found a ring, right, on the bottom of this hole. And he put the ring on, and does anybody know what power the ring gave him? The power of invisibility, right? So he puts the ring on, and suddenly he becomes invisible. What does Gyges do with the power of invisibility? Does he go out and become a kind of secret good Samaritan helping people out of difficult situations? Does he become a kind of uh, ancient world equivalent of a superhero going around and sort of doing good for the world? No, he doesn't do any of that. What does he do? He kills the king of Lydia and marries the king's wife. It's like, no, no, no messing around. I'm going straight to the top. I'm killing the king. I'm going to marry his wife and take over his position. He immediately engages in these kind of harmful, unjust, un, un, unjust acts. And the reason he does so, right, the power then of invisibility, the power, the potency of the parable of the story is, what has happened to Gyges? By being made invisible, he is being removed from being judged for the consequence of his actions. He can engage in all of these actions without anybody seeing him or judging him. And as soon as he can neither be seen nor judged, how does he behave? He behaves unjustly. Glaucon asks Socrates, would you behave justly if you didn't get any reward for it? If no one was there to reward you for your just action, would you still behave in a just manner? Or similarly, if you thought you could get away with it with no harm to your reputation, do you not have an incentive to behave in an unjust way? What works or what defines justice then is a kind of coercive environment in which actors careful about guarding their reputation must therefore shape their actions in the context of those actions being visible to others. Insofar as we can act in ways that are invisible to others, we are not inclined to be just human beings. Justice, in other words, is not an ariki. It is not a virtue that is part of us that we seek to develop and make excellent. Instead, it is a convention that we are kind of coerced into following so that we may gain the reward of reputation. That is Glaucon's argument for justice. And there are probably many of you sitting in the room thinking that sounds about right. A lot of the things that people do are there are, are so that they can gain reward for having done them. Whereas if you did them and no one would ever know, is it the kind of thing that we are likely to do? He says, perfect injustice, therefore, consists in appearing to be just when you are not. And that is ultimately what we aspire to do, right? We, appear, we, we would rather appear to be just 
than actually be just because that ultimately is the class of goods according to which Glaucon and Adiamantus argue uh, justice belongs. Adiamantus further elaborates upon this argument in ways that are actually kind of similar to what Thrasymachus did in the context of what justice versus injustice brings and the like. So let's, uh, since we're running out of time, let's quickly bring this to, an, to our discussion here to an end by noting what comes next. So after having laid out this question, this fundamental challenge, is justice in and of itself good? And is it in and of itself something in our nature? How do we then resolve this apparent problem? How do we resolve this question of justice as conventional artifact that exists as a function of coercion, or instead what Socrates would like it to be, part of the second class, something which feels good when you are just and also is good for the future? And so Socrates says, look, it's very difficult for us to determine at the level of any individual this question of what is justice, because an individual is too small an item to be able fully to appreciate all of the complexities that the question invites. Therefore, he says, when you're looking to consider these kinds of questions, sometimes it's easier to look at big things and then sort of uh, proceed to, uh, to, to scale them down to look at when, the, when they're small. He compares it to, for example, if something is written in small letters, it's difficult to make out. How do you make it clearer? You write it in bigger letters, right? And so essentially the question he asks is, is there a way for us to answer this question about justice and the human being in ways that are large enough for us to be able meaningfully to perceive and then to analyze? And so he says, well, what is something that is made up of individuals? And the answer of something that is made up of individuals is a republic. A republic consists of a bunch of individuals living together according to some set of rules that are mutually agreed upon by the citizens, by the constituents of that republic. And so in order then to answer this question of justice, uh, Socrates says, let us then consider the republic. For the republic is a constituency of individuals if we can work out what is just in the Republic, then we will be able to infer back as to what is just in the individual because a Republic is nothing more than an amalgamation of individuals. And so it's essentially an argument from analogy. The, the justice in the Republic serves then to enlighten the justice in the individual. It is simply that it is easier to discuss justice in the context of the Republic because the Republic is larger. In other words, you might think as a unit of analysis the Republic makes it easier. And so they set about in the beginning to then essentially as a thought experiment, it literally is a thought experiment, they conjure up a city in front of their eyes. They say, let's in fact then build a city. Who are we going to need inside of our city? As he says at 369C, let us construct a hypothetical city from the beginning. It is the product, apparently, of our needs. A city exists in order to respond to satisfy the needs of the individual. And so they put into their city people to grow crops, people to make the, the tools that we need to grow our crops. They have laborers and so on. And so they build up the city from scratch, introducing all the constituent components of the city itself. I'm going to stop here because at the end of all this, Glaucon says... No art of cookery, apparently, for these people you describe as living so well. In other words, you've built up this very militant, utilitarian city, as Glaucon puts it. Socrates, you have given us a city of pigs, meaning you've given us a city that only covers the bare elements of what we need, the growing of our crops, the cooking of our food, the building of our things. Is there nothing left over? Should we not have what he calls a luxurious city? Should we not consider a republic that's not just the bare minimum of what we need to survive? but also the other things that human beings like. And so they incorporate that as well. And then they proceed to build up what they call then the origin of a luxurious, uh, a luxurious city. A true city, a healthy city is what they then seek to build. And the characteristic then of the healthy city is it is going to be a city, a republic that is characterized by justice. So when we come back next week, we will then move from this preliminary observation into the question, to the, the details, what is it that then creates justice inside the Republic according to Plato? So the next time we come back, we'll look at that, books two, three, and four. Meanwhile, have a good weekend. I'll see you guys next week.